Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day as well. I see a lot of green in the audience. So um, it's a little ironic, I guess, that I'm the first talk right and early on a Sunday morning. Um, so I will plead to the audience and, and ask, please don't sleep, maybe until the end. <laughs> but maybe I can keep you entertained long enough where you can stay awake. So um, I'm Joyce Lee Iannotti. I'm a neurologist by training. Um, I'm boarded in stroke and sleep medicine. And um, I practice down the road at Banner University Medical Center um, and have really appreciated the collaboration with Barrows Neurological Institute. Um, and I'm really excited to come here to talk um, to the acromegaly community about sleep, which I of course think is really important. And hopefully you will as well at the end of this talk. So I have no conflicts of interest pertaining to this talk. And the learning objectives are pretty direct and um, we can make this really interactive. I've purposely left some time at the end so we can invite comments and questions um, and thoughts as well. So the objectives are one, to provide a case presentation of a patient I actually saw recently with pituitary dysfunction and sleep issues. Two, to understand the mechanism of sleep dysfunction with pituitary disorders and the effect of pituitary hormones on sleep regulation. Three, to recognize very common sleep disorders in pituitary disorders. And the most common ones are sleep apnea and also insomnia. And lastly, to understand the importance of addressing sleep concerns to improve the outcomes and quality of life in patients with pituitary disorders. So I'm gonna start with a case presentation. And maybe it's coincidence, um, but I actually saw this patient about three weeks ago. And it really got me thinking about um, the association of pituitary disorders and sleep and how I need to learn more about the association because this is under highlighted in the sleep medicine field. So my patient is AH. She's a 20 year old female who presents with her mother. They drove all the way from Flagstaff, Arizona and the mother provides most of the collateral history. AH again is uh, 20 years old and has a history of panhypopituitarism and she's on estradiol, progesterone, and hydrocortisone. She also has a history of septic optics dysplasia, so has visual impairment, in addition to epilepsy, but luckily her seizures are pretty infrequent, and they're only triggered by sleep deprivation and stress, and when she's in adrenal crisis. And she's on one anti-epileptic, anti-seizure medication called oxcarbamazepine. She also has a history of anxiety and is on Abilify, well-controlled, and then also a history of pretty severe autism. And her mother states that she intellectually is at the first grade level and needs help with a lot of her activities of daily living. So she comes to the sleep clinic for the first time, presenting with difficulty falling and staying asleep, really for much of her life, but for unknown reasons, um, it's, it's actually worsened in the last few years. So a PSG is a polysomnogram, and that's a sleep study. She actually went up to Flagstaff and went into the laboratory to be studied, and we'll talk about this later, but she ended up having mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea. And we use something called the apnea hypopnea index. Less than five is considered normal, and it really is an estimate of how many times you have abnormal breathing per hour. And hers was 15 times per hour. She had a prolonged sleep latency, so how long it takes from the time your, your head hits the pillow to falling asleep, and normal is considered about 30 minutes, and she took about 45 minutes, so a little bit longer. And then she woke up multiple times throughout the night. When I looked at the sleep study, it was about 20 times per hour, um, and this was related to her breathing episodes or abnormal breathing episodes. Fortunately, she did not have any seizures at night during the sleep study, but she was noted to have reduced REM sleep. And for those of you who are not familiar with REM sleep, it is the, probably the most important sleep. And it's your most restorative sleep that is in charge of memory and mental restoration. So along her journey, remember she's had sleeping difficulties all her life and she's only 20. She had seen multiple doctors and she was tried on all of these medications all at the same time and she was still on them. So some of these may sound familiar to you. So clonopin, which is clonazepam, and it's a benzodiazepine. It targets the same receptors as alcohol would, and it is used in insomnia and anxiety. 
um, but we're trying to get away from using them because of some of the downhill stream effects of some memory impairment with chronic use. Clonidine, which is actually a blood pressure medicine, but also used for anxiety. Really high doses of hydroxyzine, which is an anxiety medication. In sleep, we usually use about 50 milligrams, and you can see she was using a 200 milligrams. And then melatonin. I know melatonin is a very controversial topic, which I'm happy to discuss more, but usually our dosages are one to like 10 milligrams at most. And she had titrated all the way up to 40 milligrams. So that is a whopping dose of melatonin. And in addition to melatonin, she was on rosarum, which is the pharmacological kind of version of melatonin itself. And unlike over-the-counter melatonin, it targets both melatonin one and two receptors. And it's a fixed dose of eight milligrams. So she's already on five medications for insomnia and difficulty falling and staying asleep. And then she went to her PCP and said, ah, oh, I'm still not sleeping well. I'm only getting about five hours of sleep, according to her mother. So then gabapentin was also added at 600 milligrams and eventually titrated up to 1200 milligrams. So she had gained an hour of sleep, but she continued to wake up every night. So when she came to see us, um, we started her on auto CPAP. And auto CPAP is a really cool form of newer technology where previously when I did my fellowship, everybody had to come into the sleep lab and we had to find the right pressure setting for everybody. But now technology has advanced where it's called auto CPAP. And it's kind of a self-titrating CPAP where we, we pick a range and it usually starts at five. It can go all the way up to 20. And the machine is kind of like a smart machine, like our smartphones. So when it feels a lot of resistance, it kind of ramps up on the pressure slowly. And she was put on a range of five to 10. She initially struggled, as we all do, um, with the mask and using the machine, um, having not used it for 20 years. But by the two month mark, she was using it every night for more than four hours and actually benefiting. So her mother noticed that she stopped waking up multiple times per night. Remember, she started off at five hours of sleep with the six medications. It was increased to about six hours. But now with CPAP therapy, she was getting eight and a half hours. And her mom noticed mood changes where she was less irritable and even more attentive during the day, which are all great things. So future goals for me, I'm going to continue to follow her up follow up with her. Um, we usually see our patients every three months or more frequently. And my goal is really to start weaning her off of those medications that could not only be worsening because of all the side effects, but also worsening her sleep apnea because they ultimately cause these muscles in the neck to kind of relax. So that is my ultimate goal, but I'm so glad that she is doing much better. So now I'm going to pivot and talk about sleep drive. And this is really important because we all have gone through periods, through stress, um, life events, et cetera, even call where we are sleep deprived. And it's really important to understand that sleep has two main components when we are sleep deprived and when we're trying to get enough sleep. So the two drives are A is homeostatic sleep factor, and that's on the top. And then the second one is the circadian sleep drive, and they're kind of different. So homeostatic sleep factor is where you actually start off in the morning. You'll see that little um, starting area at 7 a.m. And your homeostatic sleep drive is really low. You're energized. You're ready to go. You're ready to get the day started. And as the day progresses, your homeostatic sleep factor starts increasing to the point where at 11 p.m. or so, you're ready to go back to sleep again because you need to kind of refill the cup. So if you are sleep deprived, so if you're on call for like three or four nights, you can satisfy the homeostatic sleep factor by crashing when you're off of call and you're basically refilling the cup again. But circadian sleep drive is very intricate and it's all about timing. So if you miss three nights of good sleep, if you crash all day the next day, you're not fulfilling the home, excuse me, the circadian sleep drive and timing is really everything. So the more sleep deprived you are, the more imperative is that you get on track in order to satisfy both of these factors. So the mechanisms of sleep disruption and pituitary disorders is either too much hormones or the actual mass effect from the enlarged pituitary gland. 
So too much hormones we know is caused um, with acromegaly with an increase in growth hormone. And that has led to an association with obstructive sleep apnea, which I'm going to tell you more about. And then Cushing's disease is an increase in cortisol and ACTH, which also has an increased risk of obstructive sleep apnea. And then thyroid hormones, we're going to be, talk about that as well, leads to hyperthyroidism, and that's been associated with anxiety and insomnia. And I'll give you measures on how to tell you have insomnia and also methods to treat it. And then the second mechanism is the mass effect from the enlarged pituitary gland. And it's really encroachment on the pineal gland. The pineal gland sits kind of posterior to the pituitary gland. And when there's mass effect and the pituitary gets bigger and bigger, it starts kind of pushing on other vital structures. And ultimately the pineal gland stops making melatonin, which is your sleep hormone. And it leads to insomnia and what we call circadian rhythm disorders where your sleep time and your wake time are completely shifted. So I'm gonna start with obstructive sleep apnea. This is most commonly seen in patients with acromegaly, again, with increased growth hormone. And older studies estimated about 20% with obstructive sleep apnea, but more recent studies estimate a high prevalence of 66% or more. And these are studies in the last five years. The growth hormone effect has a lot of effect on the soft tissues, the muscle, and the fat. And so we see enlargement of not only the mandible and also some of the neck tissue, but sometimes what we call macroglossia, which is a larger tongue. And this is a very um, extreme version of that, um, but a a kind of a sign that you can tell if your tongue is bigger than the kind of size of your mouth is looking in the mirror and looking for teeth grooves. And that means your teeth are kind of sitting uh, right where, or excuse me, your tongue is sitting right where your tooth is. And a lot of patients with macro acromegaly may have this. A lot of patients without acromegaly may have this. But it is a telltale sign of the fact that your tongue can interfere with the airflow in the back of the throat. And the treatment for this is really PAP therapy, which is CPAP therapy. <clears throat> and again, we'll talk about this in more detail. And it doesn't always resolve the sleep apnea with hormone control. So I'm going to go through this picture. Um, and the picture on the top is someone without obstructive sleep apnea. And what happens is you can see the blue kind of arrows and you get air from the nose and from the mouth. So things like nasal congestion, which is pretty pre prevalent here in the desert, um, can interfere with airflow, but also obstruction at the tongue level. And this is a person with obstructive sleep apnea. So I'm going to talk a little bit louder, but I understand that people are also hybrid. Um, so on the bottom picture, um, what you have is the tongue kind of folding in the back of the throat. We call this collapsing of the upper airway. And it basically impedes the flow of air in the nose, in the mouth, down to the lungs, and down to the vital organs. So the crude way of explaining obstructive sleep apnea to my patients is you're suffocating your brain and all of your vital organs at night because you're not getting enough oxygen. And that usually hits home to a lot of people. There's also this misunderstanding that sleep apnea is only prevalent in people who are overweight or obese. But in my clinic, I see young people who are skinny as skinny can be, um, but it's all about the tongue. It's all about the tongue and where it sits in your mouth. So this is, brings me to something called the Friedman and Malin Potty scores. And this is something, if you think you have sleep apnea, you can actually take a picture of the back of your throat, or you can look in the mirror. And this is part of the exam that we do in our sleep clinic. The Friedman is with the tongue inside the mouth, kind of resting comfortably. And then the Malampati is with the tongue sticking out. And what we're looking for is, um, I hope you can see my pointer here. Maybe not. Okay. I'm going to put yours up. Okay, but the first one is um, in the gray part um, to your left is the Friedman. And I find that this is mostly used by neurologists and ENT surgeons. And with the tongue resting comfortably, you should be able to see the palate or the tonsillar pillars, the tonsils, um, the back of the throat, and the thing that hangs in the back of your throat, which is called the uvula. In addition to the soft palate, which is in the back of the throat, and then closer to the teeth is the hard palate. And you can see as we go up in grade two, three, and four, you start seeing obscuration of the back of the throat. 
So two, you no longer see the tonsils anymore if they're still present. Three, it starts obscuring the uvula. And then four, you see nothing at all. So the higher grade your Friedman is, the more likely you are to have sleep apnea. And a lot of this has a lot to do with genetics as well. So people without acromegaly are at risk and um, oftentimes can thank their parents for their tongue size. Now the malampati is with the tongue sticking out and it's the same concept of how much of the back of the airway you can see. And these were all initially founded for difficulty intubating patients before surgery, but then they were cross extrapolated for your risk of sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea is also seen in patients with Cushing's disease, but at a much less prevalence. So remember in acromegaly, we saw rates up to 66% or more. And in Cushing's disease, it's about a third of the patients. And for one, for unclear reasons, females are two times higher than males in terms of their risk for obstructive sleep apnea. The mechanism, again, is thought to be due to neck fat accumulation, so upper airway crowding and collapsibility. And the severity of sleep apnea is directly correlated to cortisol levels. So the higher the cortisol levels, the more severe the obstructive sleep apnea is likely to be. And with Cushing's disease, we know that there is a strong association with cardiovascular disease. So it's even more important to treat obstructive sleep apnea, which is an independent risk factor for heart disease, particularly in Cushing's patients. With the increased cortisol, we know that cortisol is our stress hormone. We also see very fragmented or poor sleep. And a lot of this is decrease in sleep duration, less of that deep sleep, remember REM sleep and what we call slow wave sleep, and I'm going to talk about this in more detail, and of course, increased rates of insomnia. And then oftentimes, um, you know, especially the ENT surgeons and then there are endocrinology colleagues will see thyroid goiters, goiters. And some of them can grow to really big sizes where they start having mass effect on the, tra on the trachea, which you can see in these radiographic pictures. Um, it's estimated prevalence of sleep apnea is about 20%, especially the larger the thyroid goiter gets, the more likely the patient is to have obstructive sleep apnea. And with hyperthyroidism, it can also cause anxiety and insomnia. So these are the signs and symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. So for yourself, your family members, um, other people around you, your patients, these are the signs and symptoms to look for. And some of them are very classic in textbook. And I would say that most of the men who come in um, by the urging of their wives or bed partners are more likely to present with these symptoms. And it's the snoring, which can be very, what we call heroic, like shaking the walls. Um, witnessed apneas, where there are periods of stoppage of breathing, and that usually gets a, you a jab uh, with the elbow and the ribs to wake you up so you turn and start breathing again. And then daytime sleepiness, which is more prevalent in men. And so either drowsy driving, which is an increased risk for car accidents, or even just falling asleep at school with younger people or falling asleep at work and not feeling productive. But we know that women have a little bit more subtle symptoms. So we have to tease it out in the history when patients come to see us. So one is sleep fragmentation. We call this sleep maintenance insomnia where people are just waking up for unclear reasons. I have no idea why I wake up, um, but I fall asleep fairly quickly again. I'm not stressed out. I'm not like thinking about a million things I have to do tomorrow. I just keep waking up. The night sweats, which are often attributed to like perimenopausal or postmenopausal symptoms are actually related to sleep apnea and can have a lot to do with increased work of breathing. And then nocturia which is frequent urination. And some people are really surprised about this. So here in the desert, we drink a lot of water. And when I talk to the urologist, they can consider frequent urination as getting up to urinate more than two times per night, regardless of how much you're drinking during the daytime. Some of the other symptoms on the right-hand side are dry mouth and sore throat. And that has a lot to do with nasal congestion and then people start breathing through their mouth. And so not only do they have the cotton mouth, but again, the dryness and the sore throat. Leg kicking while sleeping, your bed partner may tell you that you just kick your legs or you seem really restless, but this is evolutionarily in place 
where if your brain is detecting that you're not getting enough oxygen, it tries everything it can to wake you up. And part of that is leg kicking. And when you wake up, you kind of take those rescue breaths. <gasps> that sound like big breaths because your brain is going into that fight or flight mode. And we call that the sympathetic mode. Morning headaches. And I know you're going to hear about uh, headaches after this uh, with Dr. Knievel, but the classic headaches that are associated with sleep apnea are those that happen in the morning when you first wake up and then they spontaneously get better as the day progresses. And it's kind of scary, but the mechanism of the headaches is thought to be to, due to the accumulation of carbon dioxide because you're not only getting oxygen in, but at night, if you have sleep apnea, you're not exhaling the carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide causes your vessels in your brains to kind of blow up and increase the cerebral blood flow. But as you get up and you're able to move your tongue out of the way, you're able to get more oxygen and also exhale the carbon dioxide levels. Other symptoms are mood changes, so worsening anxiety and depression um, despite being on antidepressants or feeling like you're doing everything you can to make it better. Decreased libido has been associated with decreased testosterone levels and also memory problems. So the most common memory problems we see related to sleep apnea is lack of attention or just lack of ability to focus and stay concentrated throughout the day. And believe it or not, I've seen patients in my clinic who come and they almost look like they have dementia. Um, they sometimes look like my Alzheimer's dementia patients. And then when they come back and they're really well treated and getting more sleep, their memory is so much better. And they almost look like completely different people. So this is a hypnogram. And I really wish I had plugged in my little pointer. Um, but at the top of it, I'm going to show you kind of a picture of a normal person. So at the very top, when you start at the left, you're awake you're supposed to fall asleep within 30 minutes, and then you cycle into what we call the non-REM stages. So stage one is drowsy, that's N1. N2 is a deeper sleep, and then N3 is slow wave sleep. And as you progress through the stages, it finally gets to the blue bars, which are your REM sleep. And you can see here as the night progresses, and these are hours, so by hour two, three, five, and about seven, you see increased amounts of REM sleep. And then finally the pa patient wakes up. And so they're getting about seven and a half to eight hours of sleep and good amounts of REM sleep. And good amounts are about 15 to 25%. The bottom is completely abnormal. This is an abnormal hypnogram where every time it hits the top line here, okay, right here uh, the patient wakes up. So we can just count. One, two, and this is also due to a of sleep apnea. So these two people are spending exactly um, the the exact same amounts of time in bed, but person one is getting seven and a half to eight hours, while the other person is in bed for eight hours and only getting maybe four hours of sleep because of the disruption. And I'm gonna highlight why these stages are so important. So I'm gonna start with the yellow bars and this is slow wave sleep. Slow wave sleep is kind of your deep sleep right before you go into REM sleep. And it's really important for your immune system and also your cognitive state. So it is in charge of boosting what we call the glymphatic system. And when I think of the glymphatic system, I think of these tiny people in your brain at night that are clearing away those abnormal proteins that are implicated in Alzheimer's dementia. So we call them amyloid beta and also tau proteins. Now the green bars are the REM sleep. And we talked about REM before. It's really in charge of your mental restoration and your memory consolidation. And this is your dream sleep. So again, normal amounts are 15 to 25%. And I often hear from people and family members and friends that um, they don't recall dreaming. And so that is really concerning to them. But the brain is a really fascinating thing. And so even though you dream, you may not recall it the next day. And I often reassure people that if you weren't getting any REM sleep for about a week, you wouldn't be here with us. 
They've done studies on animal models, like the rat models, for example. And when rats, it sounds really cruel actually, but when they got into REM sleep, they would wake them up and continue to do so to prevent them from going into long periods of REM sleep. And by day five, the rats started getting really sick and some of them even started dying. So we know that a lot of people, even though they don't recall their dreams, are actually getting REM sleep. All right, so the best way to screen patients for obstructive sleep apnea is something called the stop bang questionnaire. I teach this to the medical students, to the residents and the fellows, and I really love it because it's an acronym and it's really easy to remember. <clears throat> So it was actually validated in 2008 by a bunch of anesthesiologists, so Chung et al., and we've used it ever since, not only in the preoperative setting, but also to kind of screen the general population um, for sleep apnea. So you can kind of do this on your own, on your fingers, but I'm going to go through each one of them. And if they apply to you, then, um, you know, consider potentially getting a sleep study, but I'll tell you the measures as well. So the first part of it, the stop, are subjective symptoms. So S is snoring. T is tired. Do you often feel tired during the day? O is observed apneas, where you stop breathing at night and someone tells you. P is blood pressure problems, even if you're being treated with anti-blood pressure medicines and it's well controlled. And then the bang are the objective parts. So B is BMI greater than 35. A is age greater than 50, N is neck circumference greater than 16 inches or 40 centimeters, and then G is male gender. So if you have at least three fingers held up, then you at least need to talk to your primary care doctor about a home sleep study. And if you exceeded five or more, then you have a 90% chance of having moderate to severe sleep apnea. So you probably should come and see me or one of my colleagues. I know that a lot of the men in the audience are saying, if you're over 50 and you're a man, that puts you at disadvantage, and it certainly does. Um, but those are known risk factors for sleep apnea as well. So this is the vicious wheel of obstructive sleep apnea, and I actually have it laminated and show my patients when they come in to see me to make sure that they understand the implications down the road. So starting at the top, we talked about the memory problems, and there is now an association with early dementia and Alzheimer's if you have sleep apnea that's not treated, type 2 diabetes, stroke, heart problems like atrial fibrillation, heart attacks, and heart failure, what we call refractory hypertension or high blood pressure, where people, despite being on two or three medications, continue to have elevated blood pressures. Increased traffic and workplace accidents that may lead to death. Snoring, worsening depression and anxiety. <clears throat> and then hormone disruption, which may present as erectile dysfunction, decreased libido related to testosterone, or even early menopause in women related to the decreased amounts of estrogen and progesterone. And the two things listed at the bottom that are not in the vicious wheel that need to be added are increased risk of cancer. And David Gazal at uh, West Virginia University, he's the dean of the medical school there, has done a lot of work looking at the association of cancers, particularly lung cancer and colon cancer with untreated sleep apnea and melanoma. And then COVID severity. So we actually did a study looking at COVID when the pandemic occurred. And if you had sleep apnea, you are more likely to have be intubated on the ventilator or even die if you had sleep apnea. So these are the sleep studies, and I'd like to take time to go through this. So when I did fellowship training over a decade ago, <clears throat> everybody came into the lab, and you look like the man on, the, on your left. <clears throat> so you were really wired up, and I'm going to go from kind of head to toe. So you had the EG leads, <clears throat> which cover the front, the occipital, and the central parts of the brain. You had eye leads so that we could stage stages of sleep. You had two things on your chin. You had something over your nose, something over your mouth to look at airflow, two belts on your chest and your abdomen, something on your finger, EKG leads under your collarbones, and then leads on your legs to look for leg kicking. And then we wire you up for about 30 minutes and then we're like, okay, time to go to sleep. <laughs> With a camera, by the way, a camera that's looking at you while you sleep and the technician's watching you all night. 
So we still have those, but we reserve it for patients who are pretty severe. So either on oxygen or have COPD or emphysema, people who are sleepwalking and sleep talking and acting out their dreams, and then people with seizures at night. We still bring them into the lab. And surprisingly, people do sleep, even those who are like, I'm never, I'm not going to even get a wink in this sleep lab. Um, but we really only need two hours of sleep. But by the fortune of technology, we now have home sleep studies. And some of you may be familiar with this, either with yourself or with some of your family members. And these are super convenient and would apply to the majority of the population. So in with the man and the woman at the top, these are the cardiopulmonary devices. They're really easy and simple to put on. It's a belt over the chest, something over the nose, and then an ox oximeter on your finger. And it's good enough to tell whether you have obstructive sleep apnea or not. It may miss some of the mild cases, but for the most part, the sensitivity is as, as high as like 97%. The two other ones are really sophisticated technology that have really come out in the last three years or so. So the watch kind of looks like an Apple watch and then something over your finger. And it's able to detect not only REM and non-REM sleep by your arteries clamping down or kind of dilating but it can also tell whether you have stoppage of breathing. That's pretty cool stuff. And then the most um, non-invasive is going to be the sleep ring, which you put on your finger and it works by plasmography, similar to what the watch pad does. So all of these are good enough to look for obstructive sleep apnea. Now, the treatment of sleep apnea is, of course, weight loss, easier said than done, and then CPAP. So um, the CPAP, what it offers is a splint, kind of with forceful air that opens up all these airways. And it also kind of suppresses the tongue. Remember, it's all about the tongue. And before, again, we had to bring patients into the sleep lab to find the exact pressure setting. But now the newer machines in the black are really small, first of all. I usually tell my patients they're the size of a child's shoe box. They're really quiet. They turn on themselves. They turn off themselves. Um, and they're really easy to clean and take care of. Um, but now we can put them on that auto-adjusting kind of CPAP that I mentioned before. And there are many, many different mass types. So on the right, a lot of people think you're going to look like Darth Vader or look like the people during the, the pandemic with a huge hazmat mass. But the masks are actually really small, and they're made of hypoallergenic silicone. They can stick in your nostrils. We have a bridge that goes over the nose. We do have fa full face masks for people who are mouth breathers. But there are over 150 mass types. So don't give up on mass two or three or four. It's really about finding your Cinderella shoe. And super exciting, we're working on a project looking at 3D printing that would completely map fit your face and your facial structures because, because we know that that's very personal and individualized. <clears throat> and the machines have come a long way too. So the top two are the ResMed and Respironics. They're fairly small. When you travel, it all fits perfectly into like a laptop size bag. <clears throat> and they even have a travel machine at the bottom, which would fit right in, in your hand. It's a little bit louder than the bigger version, um, but it's very, very convenient. The alternative treatments for sleep apnea are really important too. And I want to mention that when, again, I did training, <clears throat> excuse me, 12 years ago, we had CPAP to offer and that was it. And we know that not a lot of patients can use CPAP. So not one shoe fits all. So now we have dental devices. We work with our local dentist. And these are kind of retainer devices that bring the lower jaw forward slowly. We also have tongue retaining devices, which are less popular. And that kind of suctions your tongue forward to get it out of the way. And this is really intended for patients with mild to moderate sleep apnea. But a lot of the newer studies show that patients, one, like it better and that it may be just as efficacious as CPAP therapy. So that is a new change in the sleep world. The alternative treatments um, are varied as well, and it really depends on what your sleep apnea is like. So for mild sleep apneics who are just really big snorers, you could probably get away with what we call um, the, the nose plugs or the Band-Aids. And these are called the Bongo or the Provet nasal strips. And what it's intended to do is kind of open the airway by closing the nose and causing a suction in the back of the throat. Some people have sleep apnea only on their back. Those are the lucky ones. It's the minority of people. It's probably less than 5% of people. 
And what you can do is you can use measures to stay off your back. So we used to tell people to sew tennis balls in the back of their shirts, buy an oversized shirt. And every time you roll on your back, you'd feel those balls in your back so you go on your side. But now, of course, they have more commercialized products like um, the sleep noodle. So you just put it on and it prevents you from getting on your back. And now there's more minimally invasive surgery. So there's the hypoglossal nerve stimulator, which you've probably seen commercials for. They played it at least 20 times during the Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> but it's basically like a little generator that's placed underneath um, your skin. When it senses abnormal breathing, it then stimulates the hypoglossal nerve, the peripheral branches, to protrude the tongue forward. So when this first came out about five years ago, we all envisioned people lying in bed and looking like rattlesnakes, like with their tongues sticking out. But it's actually very subtle. It's a little bit beyond your bottom teeth. You could barely see it if the patient has their mouth closed. And um, we've done about, we've, we've actually had about 43 patients so far. We're a newer program in the last two years and have been pretty impressed with the results. And these were patients who would never use CPAP. Um, I even threatened to use duct tape on them and that didn't work. Um, and duct tape their mask on, for example. Um, but this is a newer modality of treatment that has become really popular. And it's far superior to the traditional methods of surgery, where I call it rotor rootering the back of the throat, which can be very, very painful. So remember the thing that hangs in the back of the throat, the uvula, the soft palate, um, even the tonsils, it's removing all of that. And for kids, you take out their tonsils, they eat ice cream for three days and they're back to normal. For adults, it's a six month recovery and it's potentially a liquid diet, which is really tough. So we've moved away from this type of surgery. We even did tracheostomies before, but again, I think in the last 10 years, I can count one patient who had severe sleep apnea, um, but also um, lung problems that required a, tra a tracheostomy. We've looked at medications in the past and nothing really has panned out. We've looked at antidepressants for REM-related sleep apnea. We've looked at some hormone therapies and even some stimulants like theophylline, which stimulates the same receptors as caffeine, and they really haven't panned out. But I'm super excited to announce that there's a phase three clinical trial for sleep apnics of all severity, mild, moderate, severe. It's run by a company called Apnamed, and it's looking at a, a really interesting combination of a non-stimulating stimulant called adamoxetine at 80 milligrams and oxybutynin, which is used for bladder spasms at five milligrams. And this was published in a pretty prominent, we call it the Blue Journal, it's the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine by ATS. And it showed that it could reduce on average that number of 28 times of abnormal breathing per hour down to seven. So that's pretty impressive. And how great would it be um, to offer something in a pill other than CPAP therapy or major surgery for patients with sleep apnea? So I anticipate this to come out in the next year or so. Central sleep apnea is a little bit different from obstructive sleep apnea. It can also be seen in acromegaly due to derangement of the growth hormone. And this is the, the scarier form of sleep apnea, where you look over at the person with central sleep apnea, and not only do you not see any airflow, but nothing is moving. The lungs aren't moving. The abdomen isn't moving. And a lot of patients have said, oh my gosh, it scares me because I think that my partner is not alive anymore. But what it is, is that the brain is not sending signals to the lungs to breathe. So it's not triggering the diaphragm to breathe. This typically resolves, unlike obstructive sleep apnea, if you're able to get proper levels of the hormones, fortunately, the central sleep apnea typically resolves. But I did want to mention there's a newer surgery similar to the Inspire, the hypoglossal nerve stimulator, that's called the phrenic nerve stimulator that is offered to the patients with central sleep apnea. And basically what it is, is the generator still in the chest. Whenever it feels a central apneic event, it then triggers the diaphragm to take a breath. And so we have about six or seven patients who have had this with heart failure. And again, it's been pretty impressive in terms of results. Now I'm going to shift gears to insomnia. And the definition of insomnia is difficulty falling asleep or maintaining sleep. And remember, we use that 30 minute kind of rule in terms of falling asleep as a further addition to the definition. If you're not getting good amounts of sleep, this leads to a lot of daytime dysfunction. So daytime sleepiness, decreased functioning, 
And it's also been associated with sleep deprivation over time and cardiovascular disease and even stroke. So we know that patients with acromegaly and Cushing's do have insomnia, but the sad part of it is that there are not a lot of large studies where we can estimate the prevalence. So we feel like it's probably underreported and people are struggling in silence. Chronic insomnia is treatable, completely treatable. It just requires a lot of legwork on not only the physician, but a lot of the patients. And what it is, is both behavioral and it's pharmacological. So it's a combination of medication and what we call cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And I, I, I refer to this as a little bit of a boot camp for sleep because you have to be really committed to cleaning up your sleep regimen. So it's restricting the amount of time in bed instead of laying there looking at the ceiling. It's delaying the bedtime until you're ready to fall asleep. It's stimulus control. So not being stimulated by things like the phone or the iPad because the blue wavelength light decreases the amount of melatonin and leads to sleep disruption. And also, if you are unable to sleep for like 20 minutes, getting out of bed and doing something, not running a marathon, not cleaning the whole house, but making sure that you don't start associating the bed with like um, an area of terror where you're just lying there getting very anxious about not sleeping. And then I'm going to talk about sleep hygiene too. And this is something that we can start implementing even tonight. Medication wise. So as a sleep physician, when patients come and see me, I do believe in medications, but it's about picking the right medications and also setting expectations that this is not a lifelong medication because none of the medications for sleep are really good for you in the long term. And so I have some ladies who are 90 years old and they've been on Zolpidem or Ambien for like 50 years. And I kind of tell them, I say, mm, you know, if I snuck into your bedroom and switched it with a Tic Tac, you'd probably have the same effect because the chemical, kind of the chemical tolerance builds over the years and you're not benef benefiting from it chemically, but it's a psychological dependence. But then I have to assure them that I'm not going to sneak in their house. Um, <laughs> And then there are, what I like to do is when I think of medications, I like to feed two birds with one stone. We used to say kill two birds with one stone, but that's not PC anymore. So feed two birds with one stone. And what we do is we look at whether they have anxiety or depression, and we'll use like a sedating antidepressant. I love like fluvoxamine or Luvox, or even one of the tricyclic antidepressants that we use for headaches often, like amitriptyline or Elevil. And then if there are a lot of pain issues like neck pain, back pain, fibromyalgia type pain, then I love vitamin G, which we call in neurology gabapentin. And that really helps even with hot flashes and things of that sort. These are all the sleep medications and they're called sedative hypnotics for a reason. It's totally because they're here to help you with sleep, but don't really target the other things I talked about, like the pain, the headaches, and also um, anxiety and depression. I won't go through this in detail, but I do want to kind of show you the categories. So in the light gray at the top, these are very short acting, and these are targeted for people with trouble falling asleep. In the black are for people who have not only trouble falling asleep, but staying asleep. So they have longer half-lives. And at the very bottom are the really long ones that we typically use for patients with sleepwalking and sleep talking. And you can see the half-life is 23 hours. So we have to use really low dosages so people don't wake up with that hangover effect. I do want to mention that there's a newer class of medications, and that's at the top of the black row. It's called Suvorexin or Belsamra. The other ones are Lemborexin and Deradorexin. And I've been trying to switch a lot of patients onto these medications because, one, they target a mechanism completely different some, than some of the others. Um, so they're orexin, dual orexin receptor antagonists. And two, there are studies that show that it ramps up that glymphatic system. So there's little men kind of shoveling the bad proteins in your brain and may reduce the risk of dementia as well. But again, the long-term goal is that patients remain on medications for at most a year and then start using their good sleep hygiene and their cognitive behavioral therapy to start kicking in. And those are lifelong tools. So sleep hygiene, um, this is not a confessional, so you don't have to tell me whether you have good sleep hygiene or not. Um, but I really hope that 
by the end of this talk, you will start thinking if you're doing some of these don't kind of maneuvers that you really change it because I want everybody in here to live very healthy and long lives with a lot of quality. So the do's are same bedtime, wake time, whether you're weekend, vacation, St. Pat Patty's Day. Um, and that's hard to do, but I have started doing that myself in the last two years and have noticed an amazing difference. So exercise, um, it says late afternoon or early evening, but I understand that there's some morning larks who like to get up at 4 a.m. That's not me. And sometimes um, exercise early in the morning is more um, advantageous to morning larks. Have a really comfortable bedtime routine. Some people listen to music. Some people read a book. Some people take a bath, a nice relaxing bath or warm milk even. Um, and make sure that your sleep environment is really comfortable. You love your bed. You love your bedding. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. You may be surprised to hear that the recommendation for the temperature in the room at night to really ramp up on REM sleep is 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And for those international, that's 18.3 degrees Celsius. I would be freezing. <laughs> but they've been they've been doing studies on this, and people in cooler temperatures actually sleep better. Now, in the summertime, to get us in Phoenix at 65 degrees, your, your AC bill may be like $800. So um, there are cooling blankets and things like that to help consolidate your sleep as well. The don'ts, we used to say don't take naps. But there's now new literature showing that strategic napping is actually really amazing. And strategic napping are, are these small kind of power naps throughout the day, less than 30 minutes, even if you're at your office and you can kind of shut your eyes, but not very long naps that are like 4 to 7 p.m. that interfere with your nighttime routine. Evolutionarily, uh, cavemen, they didn't sleep for 10 hours at a time. They had to go hunting. And so they would do strategic napping. And a lot of the studies show that they actually lived longer than we did and had much lower rates of things like cancer and comorbidities. Alcohol, limiting alcohol, um, caffeine use, and nicotine. So we say if you're going to sleep at um, 11, maybe avoiding it four hours before your bedtime. And then watch, um, watching the clock is really brutal for people because that increases the level of anxiety that people have. And they start thinking, my goodness, it's 2 a.m., it's 3 a.m., it's 4 a.m. I'm not going to be able to function tomorrow. And again, I really do believe in the combination of medications and cognitive behavioral therapy. So lastly, I'm almost done. I do want to leave some time for questions as well. Um, but this was an article that I found in terms of quality of life and sleep in patients with pituitary adenomas in relation to tumor type and compression on the, of the optic chiasm and the role of pituitary surgery. And the objective was really to determine the effects of transphenoidal surgery on quality of life and sleep metrics. And it included 55 patients with pituitary adenomas of various types. They underwent transphenoidal surgery and they completed all these questionnaires to assess not only their quality of life, but also sleep quality. And what they found was that overall, the patients had better sleep quality subjectively. This was after surgery, sleep duration, and also sleep efficiency, which is how much the time you're in bed, you're actually asleep. And interestingly, they found the highest improvement in those with non-functioning pituitary adenomas, but non-surprisingly, those also with compression of the optic chiasm, which likely has a role in, again, the melatonin production. So the conclusions to this study is that pituitary surgery could overall impact not only your future sleep, um, but also your quality of life. And there may be a role, obviously, in um, surgery. So in summary, um, sleep disorders are prevalent in patients with pituitary disorders. Recognizing sleep disorders like obstructive sleep apnea, which is very treatable, may improve quality of life measures. Pituitary surgery may have a role in improving sleep as well. But, you know, the sad part of this, when I was doing this whole literature search preparing this talk, was that there's not a lot captured in acromegaly and pituitary patients. And we definitely need a lot more work. So I was really shocked. I was sharing this with Jill as well by the paucity of research studies looking at pituitary disorders and sleep. We know they're out there, but it's under highlighted. And that's not good. So in all of my training um, and 12 years as an attending, so in about 20 plus years, I've never heard of a single lecture regarding pituitary dysfunction and sleep. 
And I attend a lot of lectures a week, probably 10 or more. I've seen about two to three patients with pituitary disorders in my sleep clinic, which I know is not enough. So I have the feeling that a lot of patients are suffering in silence. In my PubMed search, so this is of all the research journals out there, I just put in pituitary disorders in sleep, and there are less than 20 articles in the last 30 years and only one review. So this makes me sad. I mean, they've done more research looking at erectile dysfunction and sleep than they have in, in patients with acromegaly. So we really need to collaborate all together. And um, you know, I think the best research studies that have been done have involved patient advocates. So I invite, I invite all of you um, to be a part of research and continue this scientific journey. And because of this talk, this is a first big step. So I wanna thank um, Jill and Dr. Little and Dr. Yuen. Um, this has really ignited a lot of advocacy for me too in exploring this as a sleep neurologist and a physician scientist. So I wanna thank everybody here. Um, these are my contacts, my email addresses, and I welcome any questions or comments. Thank you for your time. Yes, please. I'm the, uh, I passed the microphone. Oh, great. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very, very much. Um, so uh, hypothetical question. Uh, let's say there's someone who has uh, been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, mm -hmm. severe obstructive sleep apnea, um, is fully compliant with CPAP therapy, actually might have changed about two and a half weeks ago to BiPAP, again, purely hypothetical. Yes. And uh, one of those my friend scenarios, right? <laughs> this is not the Brady Bunch. No, 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 this is hypothetical. We'll call him Shmonathan. And, um, and, uh, He's got a lovely full head of hair. Okay, I'll I'll be here all week. Try the, um, and so so he is fully compliant, um, does everything, but still has a lot of fragmented sleep, and um, you know, just 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 exhausted. Yeah. Um, the only sleep aid he's taking, let's see, I'll make up you know a scenario: trazodone, hundred milligrams. Yeah. That's it. Um, that's that's it. Yes. So um, your friend should definitely come and see me. No, not a friend. Just, just a friend. type of, oh, he's, he's seeing a, 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 a sleep specialist. Okay. Um, her background is actually in pulmonology, not neurology. So that's part of my question too. Do you have like, I, I know your background's a little different. So I'm wondering if there's a preference or just curious what you, what you think. So I can tell you, um, so, so sleep, first of all, is very multidisciplinary. So it's not only neurologists, but pulmonologists, internal medicine, pediatricians, we even have an, uh, several anesthesiologists and anti-surgeons. And because of our background, I kind of feel like we all treat patients a little bit different. So if you were to come to me as a neurologist, my focus is all about the brain and the structures that are affected by sleep apnea. And there's a lot of literature showing that one, you still continue to have sleep fragmentation, even if you're fully compliant with CPAP therapy. So maybe finding the right sedative hypnotic that helps you sleep better, less conscientious of the mask and the machine may be an option. The other thing is we know a lot of literature and these are looking at functional MRIs showing that periods, so sorry, that there are places within the, in the brain that are areas of wakefulness that have been damaged by the time that uh, Shnonathan has not used the CPAP. Right. So even before being diagnosed. And so despite using, you know, your CPAP um, and the, your- BiPAP. BiPAP. In the hypothetical. Yes. Um, and you're preventing that further damage, you can't bring back brain neurons like you would liver tissue, for example. So what I use for those patients is our stimulants. And these are long acting stimulants they don't jack up your blood pressure. They don't jack up your heart rate. But again, we have studies showing that there's areas of brain damage and that using CPAP is going to prevent further damage, but you need a little bit of a lift to help you function. Okay. Yeah. So Perfect. those are the two things that I would explore. Absolutely. Right. And those you. are common complaints. So Shnonathan is not alone. Thank you very, very much. Of course. <laughs> Maybe we should do a stand-up routine together. Let's do it. During <laughs> at the break, okay? You got it. <laughs> yes, please. Can you speak on melatonin a little bit? 
Yeah. So melatonin is, is really controversial, maybe less so in adults than in kids. So I'll talk about kids and put it to, to rest for now. So a lot of parents are using melatonin and please know that melatonin is a hormone. So we have to be really careful in children because they're starting at a young age. And what happens is because it's a hormone, it can, it can interfere with pubertal stages of development. So in women um, or in little girls, it can interfere with, with, with what we call tanner stages, which is breast development. So in children, we say very, very low doses, even like 0 0.25 milligrams in liquid form for short periods of time. Now in adults, it's a little bit different. And so by the time you reach about 50 or so, we know that you start reducing the amount of melatonin that you make, regardless of pituitary disorder or not. So I'm a big advocate of supplementing melatonin. So again, less is more with melatonin. If you could start with one milligram or three milligram, not 40 milligrams, like my poor patient who started escalating because she wasn't responding, but know that everybody is going to metabolize melatonin a little bit differently. My other qualm with melatonin is that it is not FDA regulated. So one bottle of melatonin is going to be completely different than the other. One pill of melatonin is going to be very different than the other, kind of like CBD. I hate to say that. And so you have to be really careful and choosy in terms of what types of melatonin you use. And the only two that have been studied, and I don't have any investments in either of these companies, but um, they are called REM Fresh, R-E-M Fresh. And there's another one called Pure Encapsulations. And I believe both of them are available online and Amazon. But those are the only ones that have been studied. Is there a time limit that you can take it or just indefinitely? So I would say for adults, I would say indefinitely. And again, less is more. Um, take it 30 minutes before bedtime. Um, you know, I actually started taking it because of all the other health benefits associated with melatonin. So reduce risk of cancer, reduce risk of COVID. And so I just take a milligram at night and um, it helps my friend use uh, CPAP mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Yoon had a question and then I see people uh, in the audience. Uh, hi, Joyce. Nice to, nice to meet you. Great to see um, you. The, can you comment a little bit about the effects of uh, radiation on uh, sleep? And you know, there, I'm sure there's some patients here who have had radiation uh -huh. uh, plus and minus surgery. Oh, goodness. I knew Dr. Yoon would get me. <laughs> So um, I actually, in my literature search, I didn't come across a lot um, with radiation therapy and effect on sleep, but um, I can go back and look again. But I'm I'm interested, Dr. Ewan, from your experience, what have you noticed after radiation? I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, I, I think there's an effect. Um, I think there are some patients who do have this disturbed sleep. Uh, I'm not sure the intricacies of how it's affecting the sleep, but definitely there is a uh, effect more so because most of these patients have had surgery or maybe one or even two surgeries and then radiation. Um, and that I suspect can compound the effects even more, particularly when the, the hypothalamus is also affected some in some way. Yes, absolutely. It makes complete sense. Yeah. I will do another, another literature search and email you if I find Thanks. something, but yeah. it could also be an amazing research study. Yeah, yeah, we should collaborate there. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And I wonder, yes. I know you had your hand up um, in the front. So I wonder, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Okay. My, my question, I guess she's a friend of Shnonathan's, but has um, everything that you mentioned, the acromegaly, Cushing's, um, and hyperthyroid. Okay. So sleep is just almost unheard of. Um, maybe um, sometimes 36 hours straight, wide awake, work two days straight, no sleep. Um, but the only option for um, sleep help is, like someone said, a pulmonologist. And all they do is, you know, here's sleep, here's a CPAP now, have a nice day, have a nice life, and I'll see you next year. Um, where, what help is there? Where can we go? What where would you recommend if you don't live anywhere near Arizona? Um, yeah. What type of what type of help would you recommend? Look, you know, getting 
So um, that's a really good question. And I think pituitary patients and disorders are so complicated that I almost feel like you need a better understanding of the brain and the mechanisms. So regardless of where you live, I know that this is an international conference, please email me and I can find someone, either a colleague I know or someone who is within the field of neurology and would understand your struggles. And I'm happy to send you a list of, of providers in your area. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful question. Um, kind of following on from Dr. Yuan's question and the other earlier about melatonin, you mentioned in one of your slides, mass effect, the um, impact on pineal gland function. Is there any particular workup to assess pineal function, uh, labs, MRI? Yeah, wow. I was told that you guys had really great questions and you are owning up to it. That's an amazing question. So um, because it, it's actually become commercially available of recent. Um, I would have to do a little bit work because I haven't actually ordered it yet, but it's actually quantitatively looking at melatonin levels. We call it dim light melatonin. Um, and we, it's used more for like circadian rhythm problems. For, so for people with night owl syndrome or morning lark, but we could quantitatively look at your melatonin levels for sure. Yeah, really great question. I have a few. Of course. Okay. So the the sleep tests that you show, are those going to like tell you if you need a CPAP or a BiPAP? Yes. Okay. Well, oh, that's a good question. Oh, yeah. These are really sophisticated questions. Yeah. So no, they're not going to okay. um, tell you whether you need different modes of therapy, but for the majority of people, we do try auto CPAP first. And then what's nice is there's a modem within the machine. So if we start seeing your numbers being off and you're not responding well, or your oxygen levels being low, that's when we would switch you to even auto bi-level PAP. So say with the recall that they had, mm -hmm. that they sent the patient a replacement device without a chip. Can you, can people get the chips? You can get the chip okay. now. Um, you can get the chip from your sleep provider. So we give out some of the chips. Okay. The modem itself, you can buy now. Um, it is available under insurance. If you pay out of pocket, it's about $300. Okay. But this was all due to the pandemic. So as you know, there's a lot of overseas products that weren't available you know, the chips and like the Land Rovers yeah. and things like that. Um, but the modems were really hard to get um, in new machines during okay. the pandemic. But now that we're past the pandemic, I feel like all of those are readily available and you can get it through your device company even. Oh, fantastic. Okay. I... Oh. oh, I, no, no. Um, Smizabil has a CPAP, um, but Smizabel might need a beat by yeah. Um, and then um, have you heard of people doing palate surgery to improve? D what do you think? Uh, Smizabel went yeah. to a dentist that specializes in sleep. Mm -hmm. And that dentist said that the reason people are snoring is because, oh my God, this is was hilarious. We aren't breastfeeding children long enough oh. to build up the palate muscles and our palate muscles are weak and that is causing snoring. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's he's, he said that, uh, in the past people breastfed their kids till they were five or six, oh. which strengthened up their palates. Oh, well, I don't, I don't know if I, I can wish, advocate for that. I really wish I could have recorded this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you to our dentist. <laughs> oh, I have more. Um, so I, I, for Schmidt, 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 so um, I would say avoid surgery if you can. If you're yeah. using your machine, um, then I would avoid surgery. So I'm not ready for surgery myself. Um, mm. And it's a big step. It's a big step. And it's not always curative. Yeah. When 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 the dentist gave me his reasonings, I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> um, and then say Shmizabella is sleeping and she's using her 
CPAP on a regular basis and it's up to 10, mm -hmm. but yet I, Isabel can feel her palate dropping, not her tongue moving backwards. Yeah. Is that a thing? It can be a thing. And it may mean um, if you're at higher elevation um, for people who may have an extra glass of wine, you have more collapsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and as we get older, um, especially with women, our hormone changes, our hormone levels change. So it may mean creeping up your pressure just a tad bit to 11 or 12. Okay. Yeah. Cause Schmizabel lives at 6,500. So that's possible. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and then you said you don't recommend tonsil like as an adult, because no. I would love to get rid of mine. No. Um, unless you have enlarged tonsils that are causing what we call dysphagia, which is trouble swallowing. Or Schmizabel has tonsil stones. Uh, that could be an indication but yeah. it is a brutal surgery if you're yeah. above the age of eight. I am definitely above the age so of eight. So risk versus benefits. All right, one quick question. Can you practice in other states? I'm sorry? <laughs> oh, sure. Where are you from? Oh. Of course, I love Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> There's one last Thank question you. in the back. She's oh. She's been standing for a while. Thank you. I have a much less sophisticated question probably. What's your take on um, smartwatches and sleep? Yeah. Do you recommend? I love them. I love them. So um, it really depends on what type of person you are. Um, so is Apple, even the Apple watch is really nice. They're Fitbits. There's the Aura Ring. Um, there's so many wearables. The last time I counted, they're over 50. And if you're the type of person who looks at your behaviors and then looks at your data and says, oh, maybe I should have stayed out a little bit later with my friends because it affected my sleep then it's positive. But I have other patients who are type A, like a lot of us in medicine, and a little bit OCD, where they predetermine their day based on their data watch, which is not 100% accurate. So I've had patients come and see me and be like, oh, I only got 5% of REM, so today's gonna be awful. And I'm like, it's 6 a.m. The day has just started. So um, for those people who kind of belabor it, and then again, predetermine based on kind of like 50% accurate data, I don't use it for them, but for people like you who, you know, are really using it to collect data and mimic, like if you have a good night to do that again, I love it. It's just data for us to see. Thank you so much.